Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today for um, today's One Stop Business Workshop, which is about chain of title. Uh, so chain of title is, sounds a bit mysterious, but uh, we're going to clear up all the mystery today. Um, and it's something that's really important to get right from the start. Um, we are super grateful to have uh, Rachel Rusin joining us currently. Rachel is the CEO um, and the Manitoba uh, film, the film commissioner for Manitoba at uh, Manitoba Film and Music. Um, and as part of her job, she leads the province's parent corporation, which is charged with driving Manitoba's dynamic film industry. Uh, prior to joining Manitoba Film and Music, Rachel was a partner with MLT Akins LLP. So she's been practicing entertainment and uh, general commercial law since 1997. Um, and uh, we're so pleased to have you here today, Rachel, to help fill us in and, and get us started on chain of title. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcia. And thank you to the CBC and the CMPA and everyone for putting this session on. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, chain and title is such an important, um, an important concept for a production to understand. And it's something that needs to be dealt with early on. So I'm thrilled that you're joining me today. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. What I wanna talk about is why chain of title is so important. And what you'll see as we get into the deck is that um, you should not wait until you're about to sell a property to really give some thought to your chain of title and making sure all rights are owned by production before exploiting. Obviously, the sooner you do it, the less stressed you are, of course. But as you're about to sell a piece of uh, copyright or a piece of property, it, it becomes more expensive to negotiate with any other rights holders if you haven't bundled those rights ahead of time. So when I was practicing law, I always advised my clients, deal with your chain of title right as early as inception as you can. Next slide, please. So what is chain of title and why does it matter? That's the big question. Chain of title, in essence, it is your paper trail. It is what establishes rights with respect to property, and it is, can be owned by a person or any entity. And it's called the chain because it's linked, and it starts with inception or creation right through until the present owner. What determines copyright, of course, can be in literary, musical, dramatic, or artistic work. And so documents or contracts can establish the clear chain of title. And that will help identify who owns or who controls rights necessary to produce any kind of production based on material. Next slide, please. So chain of title documents. I get asked that a lot. And when I was practicing and I would say to my clients, I'm putting together your chain of title opinion, they would say, what do you need? So what I need are any documents that establish any rights to a particular piece of work. So copyright registrations, if any, not always required or at all required. Underlying rights, which can be ideas, life stories, book rights. They can be underlying rights agreements with the broadcaster. They can be option agreements or the purchase agreements which exercise the right of an option. They are your co-production agreements, joint venture agreements. Next slide, please. There are also any type of composer lyricist agreements, transfer agreements, assignment agreements that happen over the course of a property, starting with shop agreements through your option right forward, contracts with any key creatives, performers, and releases. And what's important to note is just what I would always say to my clients, anytime you have an agreement where somebody touches upon or modifies or could obtain rights to your property, you want to make sure that document has automatic assignment clauses and make sure it's owned by production. So production would want to make sure that any type of a contract or deal memo it has indicates that all rights are the exclusive ownership of the production. Next slide, please. What's important is to have a clean chain of title, no kinks in the chain, which is the complete timeline to show 100% original ownership or rights are owned by the person who wishes to exploit them at the time. And again, I, I want to comment about the fact that anytime somebody touches upon rights that could add any creative or other elements uh, that could cause a dispute, you want to make sure you have a clear chain of title. 
because I can tell you that in my practice, I was not just acting for independent producers, but I acted for banks, lenders, and agencies with respect to financing. And they want to know you have clear chain of title. And if there's any dispute, right or wrong, those who are going to purchase the work or lend or collateralize based on it are going to pause until production establishes a clear chain of title. So that's really, really important because the risk liability wants to be mitigated by all those who are going to help exploit it and invest in it. Next slide, please. So what can go wrong? Lots can go wrong. Deal memos, which we are all aware of, um, which often haunt entertainment lawyers, but the truth is entertainment law clients are very sophisticated and they know what they need to do. So very often deal memos are just written down and they're very brief, but they're not always comprehensive to deal with issues like chain of title. They don't often deal with other things, which is my second point, which is reversion of rights. So by way of example, if um, there's an option agreement out there and uh, work is optioned, you want to make sure potentially you deal with what happens at the end of the option. Who owns that piece of work? Does it revert to the owner? Does it have to be purchased? Certain things have to be dealt with to try to get as much certainty in the contract as possible. So it's not that a deal memo in and of itself is wrong. It's just what is the contents and the meat and potatoes of that deal memo. Other things that can go wrong very often in a, in a collaboration stage, right at the beginning, I see this a lot, uh, friends or colleagues who have long-term relationships sit together and spitball ideas and write it on paper. And because of the relationship, they don't always document who owns what or how are these rights dealt with. And then issues can come around and one person wants to capitalize on it and they have something in their back pocket to sell. And now it's an issue about getting that sign off of the rights holder. So I always say, deal with it up front. And I used to always say, you know, blame your lawyer, throw me under a bus, say, you know, hey, I, I want to document this. My lawyer says I need to best protect us both. So do you mind entering into um, a collaboration agreement with me, some sort of a writer's agreement to deal with issues like ownership of rights so that there's cl a clean chain of title going forward. Moral rights. Moral rights become an issue too because they are the, uh, the natural and inherent rights of a creator. And so you want to make sure as production that when you're dealing with assignment of rights, waiver of moral rights are included in that. It's pretty, pretty standard. We see that more often than not. And a lot of uh, sophisticated producers just know to throw that clause in those deal memos, whether they have counsel or not. But occasionally I've come across situations where that was not present. Um, other things that can go wrong are issues like book rights, um, when, when rights are shared with publishers as well as authors, same with music and publishers, um, and as well as incomplete documents. Um, you wanna make sure that those who are assigning or transferring rights are doing so in the proper way. If it's from an entity, a corporation to another corporation, uh, you need to make sure it's authorized by the proper authority. There's corporate authority to do so and it's enforceable and binding. And then we wanna be mindful of issues like bankruptcy and insolvency um, because those do, those, do affect, uh, those do affect rights. You know, when we, when we deal with chain of title and, and I, I just wanna pause and, and, and speak a little generally, we're dealing with protection of rights and issues like I mentioned before, copyright, um, it's not required. Uh, a person's right exists in the creation of work, but sometimes uh, a registration of a copyright is helpful in the event of a problem. It, it helps build a case and, and show evidence of that. Um, and, and, and so what I always uh, try to deal with is, is recognizing that clients need to understand what they're looking to protect. So if it's a script, you don't necessarily have to um, uh, register it with uh, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. It is, it is an option. You don't have to register it necessarily with Writers Guild. It is an option, but copyright does exist upon, uh, upon creation. Um, before, we, I think our next slide is the questions, is it not? Yes, but before, before we go to that slide, I, I wanted to just um, talk a little bit about um, some other things about counsel, for instance. You don't need a lawyer to help you with chain of title. It's highly recommended because as I've been trying to focus on the concept of making sure those rights are dealt with um, 
are really, really important and missing something along the chain can become incredibly costly. Chain of title is not expensive to protect with a lawyer. There's, there tends to be a bit of an investment in the beginning, but I can tell you that in my experience, making sure and investing upfront in a proper chain of title will mitigate loss, will save money in the end, and establishes a good protocol for business uh, on, on, a, on a going forward basis. Um, I mean, that, that is sort of the essence of what chain of title is and, and how it needs to be protected. I, I think what's also important to know is um, that that chain of title that you start to work on is never, it's a dynamic situation. It grows. It's a live document because as we know, works are often created and then they sit and then they're sold and then they revert and somebody adds to it and then it gets changed and so you always have to revisit your chain of title and I would always tell my clients it's like writing your will you want to look at it every couple of years and see what's changed who's added who's not so it, it, you know it's very easy to start with the creation of the work sometimes you have to go backwards if it's gone through a, a long process but chains of title can become a situation where you actually need to graph it out and, and do a roadmap because there's been so much involvement along the way. So my, my longstanding advice is start early. If you haven't done it yet, go back, create it and let it sit. And every now and again, when you're dealing with your property prior to it being sold and even after it's sold, because the territory or the timeline of the um, duration of a, of a sale reverts back and then you have to deal with it again. So constantly revisit uh, your chain of title and, and see where see where it takes you. Um, Marcia, do you have any questions in particular you wanna deal with at this time? Sure, and actually we've been getting lots of questions from our audience, which is really exciting. So um, thank you. So why don't we actually, um, off the top, I'll just ask you one quick question, which I think is really simple. And it's just, is there any difference in chain of title for different kinds of works? So some people might be making a film or someone might be making a web series or a documentary. So just wondering if there's any difference in that or this is a universal um, approach that needs to be taken. Um, good question. It's not so much that there is a difference in what is required. It's just the documents themselves might be different. So, um, you know, examples, for instance, I worked on um, television series that were being licensed by CBC that were a co-creation, for instance, between CBC and a production. And so there's an example, a broadcaster would give an underlying rights agreement that becomes a chain of title document because there's rights in there. Um, and so it, it, it really only depends on what the original owner or creator of the work has done with their property from the time they created it to the time that they exploit it. So all of those types of events happen. So it, it's not so much specific to whether it's film or whether it is television. It's just any document that purports to establish rights and of work need to be documented and assigned to production so that production can then enter into its form of agreements. And, and a follow up to that based on what you just said. So um, if you had another season of your production, is that a new chain of title or is it more like what you were saying? It's a living document. So you're adding on to it and all the documents from the previous season become part of it. You will add to it. Sometimes um, you, you don't, you know, if you're doing a, a series, you don't need to contain the underlying rights agreements necessarily in the past for that new piece of work, but you always need to keep adding to it again every time something changes. But usually what happens is if you're dealing with the second season, then all of the rights to the first season will be assigned to that prod po that's now dealing with season two. And so they encapsulate what has already existed and then they build upon it from there. But everything that underlined, you can't have season two if you don't have rights to season one. So the season one would have to be assigned and transferred to that new entity that is producing the next season. Because as you know, there's always a new prod code that's taking over that next season. And so they need to have all of the rights to the first and then they build upon that. And then that gets taken to the next one and the next one and the next one, it continues to build. And that's why it's called the chain. Excellent. Um, all right. Could you explain a little bit what an option is and the option agreement and then maybe what the difference might be between an option agreement and a shopping agreement? Great question. Um, a shop agreement doesn't purport to give rights other than the right to shop it 
and the right to, to look and determine if there's interest within the marketplace. So it is a limited right for that purpose. In an option agreement, a producer would uh, purport to have the option to purchase a piece of work. Uh, so they option it and then once they then they have that right and an option can either be exclusive or non-exclusive. But if production took an exclusive option, for instance, to a writer, uh, that option could exist for several periods of time. There could be separate option periods. So say option, the first option period could be a period of six months. It's all negotiated. Uh, option two could be an additional six months. You could have a couple of option periods in there. And the way it would work is at the end of that option period, the producer would have the irrevocable right to purchase it based on the purchase price within that option or the option lapses. So it's, it's basically like a standstill for the owner while that option is exercised and producer has enough time within that option period to purchase it. Where option agreements can go wrong is if they don't have a purchase price or a mechanism for purchase, it's a faulty option. So again, um, I, I always advise production to at least work with counsel on establishing baseline documents. We as lawyers always caution about precedents. They should never be something that you look at totally in isolation, but it's a good building block to make sure that you have the basis upon what you want to put in there. But the option agreement is the it has within it that transfer of rights. And very often uh, the case is, is that upon making the purchase payment from producer to rights holder, the rights are automatically assigned and transferred and it becomes an irrevocable option. And is there a minimum purchase price? Like uh, how do you figure out what that purchase price should be? It really depends if it's writer's guild. So, you know, there are um, there are certain minimums like a 10% option price when you're dealing with guilds and unions. But if you're dealing with a, a, a non-union member, it can be a negotiated amount. I've seen options for $10 and I've seen options for $100,000. It, it depends. There is rights of negotiation, but of course, collective agreements do determine minimum standards when they are covered by that. Um, so another question we've had is, uh, what do you need to think about in terms of documentaries? So when does the chain of title start there and, and what sorts of agreements do you need to factor in from very early on from doc for documentaries? Life rights are uh, among the most difficult to secure in because they're very sensitive. It's somebody's right to their story and their voice. And yet um, as producer counsel, you understand that producers actually need to have the ability to create their production um, with, with certain um, approval rights. And it's very awkward sometimes to uh, negotiate and discuss with an owner their story and yet say, but I have the right to modify that and fictionalize that and do what I want, but please sell me your life rights. So when you're dealing with situations like a documentary that might be about somebody's rights, your chain of title starts upon negotiating rights. So you wanna make sure that that assignment of those life rights uh, from that person are dealt with immediately. And that document, you would wanna make sure that it covers what producer can do because the worst thing in those situations if midway through production or prep or upon selling something, producer has to go back to that rights and try to secure more rights. So you wanna to try to be as broad and encompassing uh, from producer standpoint as possible but broadcasters and distributors are gonna be very mindful of making sure that life rights are properly secured in a manner because they are so sensitive, they do become issues for dispute later down the road. And in terms of mitigating, uh, mitigating liabilities, those buyers wanna make sure that it, it's, been, uh, it's been dealt with. So when you're dealing with documentaries, everybody, if you're dealing with true events or if you're basing it upon another work, you wanna make sure that all of those rights are there. And that um, leads to a, a different question a little bit. And I, I think you covered it in your presentation, but. Um, you know, you talked about events or real stories. So often you find things like that on the internet or in a, a newspaper or whatever. Um, I guess I, I know the answer to this question, but is everything on the internet free? Like, what do we need to think about when things Oh, it's all safe and on? free. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are certain things like, uh, you know, Creative Commons where you can go and buy uh, and purchase um, rights 
um, that is either public domain or where you don't have to purchase it, you can use it, or whether certain creators are, are, are creating a platform in which a non-exclusive way you can, you can purchase. But again, you have to be very, very careful about those licenses that you're not just purchasing and paying them, but you are doing so within the confines of that license, how you can utilize it. Because I've seen clients get into trouble where they say, look, I, I purchased this. I paid $150 to use this. Why am I being sued? And I say, because you purchased to use it in one fashion, however you used it in another that violated the license you exposed it, or you didn't credit the author of that work. And so I always caution uh, people when buying licenses, it's a really good opportunity to, to speak to counsel and say anything I need to worry about because the terms of the license need to be really understood before saying, yes, I can go and do that. So I'm more cautious about purchasing uh, through the internet than I am dealing with chain of title in what you've controlled and the people that you've brought in. Okay. So from a, a writer and creator perspective, um, what are things that you should be thinking through to sort of start, I don't know, collecting or show chain of title that's something based on your own original writing, uh, especially, and then, you know, similar to that, if you are self-developing a project and you've already written the script, do you have to option your own work? No, copyright is inherent upon creation. You own it. And if you've solely created it, you're okay. That is your chain. If you have had it polished, edited, somebody's contributed to it, that's where I get concerned. So um, before uh, a writer parts with their work to get input from somebody else, that's where I establish or try to help them establish a writer agreement, a form of collaboration agreement, something that says, um, I mean, in Canada, we don't use expression work for hire, but something that says I am writing this and all rights of every nature kind whatsoever in perpetuity now heretofore are owned by production. And it is an inherent transfer and that's what you pay for. I mean, there has to be consideration and that's, that's what you pay for. You know, works that are not protected from copyright are facts, um, ideas. It, it's the expression of the idea that is protected. So, you know, I would give the example, there's a million and one medical shows, whether you're watching Grey's Anatomy as it was, or Chicago Hope as it used to be, or The Good Doctor, anything. So the concept of uh, a, a television series within a hospital is not what's protected, but it's the expression and how that is created that is what is protecting. And, and what about if there's a, a joint owner of the work or, or if you had a, a co-writer um, what do you need to think about? Like, can both parties potentially um, license or exploit it on a non-exclusive basis? How, how does it work when there are multiple owners? Or, or Co-writers um, can become uh, an issue in terms of what happens, right? It's a marriage. And so what happens upon divorce? What happens if somebody wants to go in a different direction from their writing partner? Those are all things that should together uh, work with how that writer writer agreement is it should contemplate it because if you have two writers and you equally own the work and one wants to sell and the other's not interested you have a kink in the chain you don't have clear chain of title and so when one writer goes and tries to sell that piece of work and the the, the buyer says oh fantastic I need your co-writer to sign off and the writer says well they won't purchaser is going to say great idea clean up your chain I can't take that on because I can't risk that that co-writer is going to sue us for exploiting work that we didn't have consent to do. So those are the things that need to be thought of. Um, getting lots of questions, which is good. Um, in terms of documentary life rights, mm -hmm. um, does a personal release, is, is that enough? Like, how do you actually purchase life rights um, so that you can get sign up for the main subject of a film? You have to talk about what those rights are. So, um, you know, look at it like as a person in appearance release, for instance. If you have a release that says you get to use somebody's name and voice, but you don't get to, but you don't write in there likeness or biography or image, you don't have those rights. You would then have to go back and get those rights. So when working on B-roll or, or marketing, or your promotion and you want to write about somebody, you, don't, you have to go back and negotiate those rights. In the eyes of a sale, going back to a rights holder that you might've been able to get those rights for 
who now see that you're going to make some money off them, they're going to maybe consider saying, you know what, I'd like you to pay me for those rights. So when you're dealing with someone's story, um, you know, there was, there used to be a joke in entertainment law. We used to say, you want to own somebody's story, their dreams, their past, their present, their future. You want to try to see what are you going to need? Prequel, sequel, modification, adaptation. Make sure it's all forms of media. Do you want to make sure that you capture, potentially it's going to become animated or not? So you want to try to be as broad as you can. And the, the issues that you would have faced later down the road that will ruin your chance of exploiting the production, deal with that up front. Be absolutely transparent with the rights holder into how you acquire them and see what, what you're going to be dealing with. Because if you have a rights holder who says, and I've had this happen a lot with, with life rights and documentaries, and they say, you can have my life rights, but I want final approval of script. I want full and final approval of everything. I would caution production. That's very dangerous because if a, if a buyer is often the case, sometimes we know a broadcaster or a studio or a buyer might say, fabulous idea, we want to change the name. Fabulous idea, we want to modify this. If that life rights holder has only negotiated with production that they get full and final approval, they're basically at every meeting with you. Maybe that works, but I would not recommend that. I, I always want to make sure that production um, appropriately and responsibly has the greatest amount of flexibility to be able to exploit and commercialize their product that they have invested in, that they have taken the risk for. And so making sure that they maintain it. So I would always, as an example with that, I would say, um, you know, why don't you go back to the rights holder and ask and tell them that they can have meaningful consultation but they cannot have final approvals. So again, it's it sort of, it touches upon chain of title. It's not your chain, but it does interfere in rights. So try to negotiate that upfront um, and, and try to look into as much of a crystal ball as you can to say, and that's where counsel comes into play. What do I need to do to protect my rights so that I can comfortably invest in development and funding and try to sell my property without knowing that everybody I acquired it from could raise their hand and say, uh oh, that's mine. You didn't do that properly. So a follow up to that. And I'm, I'm going to ask kind of two questions that are linked and just say, I think this will probably be our last questions. And thank you so much. And um, we'll take the other questions that we've gotten today um, that we haven't gotten to and uh, we'll figure a way to get back to everyone. Sure. Um, so following that more more from the producer perspective if they're trying to purchase something how would you advise that they could look at the sort of chain of title that might already exist like are, should they ask for underlying rights or publishing rights and then lastly um, are there any resources or things that we can point to or post later potentially that might be good examples of chain of title or, or where to look so that people who are interested can get they can get into this more excellent questions um in the option agreements that producers um, are going to sign with respect to a rights holder, I always make sure that they have comprehensive representations and warranties from the owner of the work. So by example, I would wanna make sure that the owner of the work represents and warrants to production that they are the rights holder. They own all each and every right necessary to entitle production, to exploit, commercialize, and modify, adapt, assign all rights. Um, and, and so forth and so forth. And while that option agreement is being sent to the rights holder, they have to sign and represent that. Um, listen, nobody wants to go into something knowing that they have a right to sue, but at the same time, production needs to be able to make those reps and warranties because when the broadcaster or buyer then comes to production, production has to make those same representations and warranties to them. So production can't say to a buyer, I production, have every right necessary because unless those that came before them told them that they own those rights to give to producer, producer won't know he, she, or it have chain of title. So that's part of the chain is the representations and the warranties and the certification from the rights holder. And a sophisticated production, if they're, if they're authorizing rights and they're trying to option rights by, sorry, my apologies, if they're trying to option rights, they're gonna wanna say to that rights creator, hey, do you own all of those rights? Uh, if it's a book, if you're optioning a book, you're going to want to be able to say, do you own those rights versus your publisher? Who owns the rights to give the option? I have on occasion had to have the publisher also sign an option agreement to make sure rights are owned. But those representations and warranties are absolutely essential in any type of a document. 
Excellent. Well, believe it or not, we've run out of time and there are tons more questions. Um, but again, maybe um, we'll, we'll circle back with those of you who sent direct questions um, and um, we'll see if we can find some resources that we can point people to. But as Rachel has um, so aptly pointed out on the call, it's complicated and, and you want to think about who you might need to help you through this to make sure that you've got what you need in order to move forward and um, not only get your work made, but get it seen. Um, so thank you so very much, Rachel Rosen, and to CBC and to CAFCO and um, to all of you. And I believe the next session will be Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we can't wait to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Good luck.